Welcome, everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to welcome you all to um, the 2022 Distinguished Faculty of Awards. Um, and we're going to begin the program with a video message from our chancellor. Good afternoon, and welcome to UMass Boston's 12th Annual Distinguished Faculty Lecture. I am sorry I could not be with you in person today, but I am grateful for the opportunity to offer a few thoughts on this very special occasion. Established in 1978, the Chancellor's Award for Distinguished Scholarship, Service, and Teaching are presented each year to three faculty members who have made exceptional contributions in these areas of faculty responsibility. Honorees are then invited to address the university community at this lecture to share reflections on the award and their work at UMass Boston. Indeed, honoring the achievements of faculty members shines a light on UMass Boston's academic excellence in advancing knowledge and having impact in the world. The 2022 recipient of the Chancellor's Award for Distinguished Scholarship is Professor Mark Warren in the Department of Public Policy and Public Affairs. Professor Warren embodies the community-engaged scholarship we prize at UMass Boston. His research engages community organizations through which parents and students of color address systemic racial injustice and generate community-based solutions for making public education more just and equitable for all. The 2022 recipient of the Chancellor's Award for Distinguished Teaching is Professor of Psychology, Laurel Weinwright, a UMass Boston faculty member for 36 years, Professor Wainwright has taught more than 14 courses and contributed to the development of 21 others. She has been exemplary in providing accessible, engaging, and compassionate education with a student-centered teaching perspective. And finally, the 2022 recipient of the Chancellor's Award for distinguished service is Professor Pratima Prasad in the College of Liberal Arts. Dr. Prasad has developed many student success initiatives over the years aimed at showcasing the best of UMass Boston. Her work on strengthening her field of scholarship by engaging more junior faculty in conferences has been especially effective and important, as is her modeling of equity and inclusion in higher education. We are grateful for your passionate commitments to outstanding scholarship, teaching, and service. And we are proud to see your work recognized. I know all of us are looking forward to your presentations. Please accept my congratulations and best wishes for continued success here at UMass Boston. Thank you. Good afternoon again. And Chancellor Suarez Orozco wanted to make sure that um, I re-emphasize that he apologized that he could not be here with all of us this afternoon. But he is truly grateful for the outstanding contributions and accomplishments of our distinguished hon honorees. And it's particularly appropriate that we recognize and celebrate the outstanding work that the three of you have contributed to the great public university here in Boston, UMass Boston. The endeavors are truly worth our attention, our note, and our deep, deep heartfelt appreciation. Your work has made significant accomplishments, 
pave the way for positive impacts for so many members of our community. Students, faculty, staff, alumni here on campus, but also members of the broader communities to which we, we all belong. So as we gather here this afternoon, it really is fitting that we honor your achievements in the three key domains of the mission of UMass Boston, teaching, research, and service. And I want to say a little bit more about each of you, beginning with Professor Mark Warren, an inspiring and distinguished scholar who has already been presented with numerous awards for his scholarship, including the Steve Biko Award for Educational Innovation and Justice from the Scribes Institute, the inaugural Cambridge College Social Justice Educator Award. Um, he's also been honored as a fellow of the American Education Research Association in 2020 and received the Sage Sarah Miller McCune Fellowship at Stanford Center for the Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences and it, yet there's more, the John Simon Guggenheim Memorial Foundation Fellowship. His most recent book, Willful Defiance, the Movement to Dismantle the School to Prison Pipeline is a timely and profound piece of scholarship that is worth all of us reading. It was published earlier this year by Oxford University Press. And I've noticed that uh, the willful defiance is also the, the main title of this afternoon's lecture. But it fits with Professor Warren's career in which he's made extraordinary contributions to community engagement, to social justice, racial equity, in education and community development. And it makes him more than deserving of this year's Chancellor's Distinguished Scholarship Award. And so we do look forward to hearing your lecture on willful defiance, community-engaged scholarship, and educational justice. We're also here to honor and recognize Laurel Wainwright, Chair of the Psychology Department, who has been a stellar example of a teacher who provides accessible, engaging, and compassionate education with a student-centered teaching perspective. During Laurel's 36-year distinguished career here at UMass Boston, she has contributed to dozens of distinct courses and teaches statistics at the undergraduate and the graduate level. Although many students may find statistics challenging and even a frustrating subject. Having taught statistics myself in the past, I can attest to this. Laurel relentlessly works to provide quality course materials that makes, again, this sometimes difficult topic accessible. She fosters close relationships with her students, engages in formal and informal mentorships, and students note that she does so in a compassionate way and praise her for her comprehensive, individualized efforts. But it's not just the students that appreciate Laurel's work. It's also her colleagues. One colleague in her department spotlighted the incredible impact she has um, made not just on students, but on her colleagues for her willingness to help others with their pedagogy and their approach to teaching and learning. And this was particularly evident when we all had to rapidly pivot to remote instruction in 2020, when she did so much to help others um, to make that shift. Her dedication to teaching and learning excellence is inspiring. And I, along with the rest of you, am eager to hear her lecture, How Much Can We Pivot? And finally, it's my real genuine honor and pleasure to recognize Dr. Pratima Prasad, who in addition to her responsibilities as an associate dean in the College of Liberal Arts and associate professor of French, has been a champion for an inspirational contributor to a plethora of initiatives that benefit 
students, faculty, and staff alike, not just throughout CLA, but throughout our entire campus. Her vigorous work, not only to strengthen what happens here on campus, but to strengthen what happens in her professional field, advocating for, supporting, and mentoring earlier career colleagues, not just here, but elsewhere, has proven to be an opportunity for UMass Boston to be elevated and spotlighted more broadly than just even on our campus. Dr. Prasad has continually stepped up and plays a pivotal role in providing steadfast leadership across the entire campus. She focuses her work on equity and inclusion in the true spirit and aligned with the values-driven tradition of UMass Boston. Her selfless efforts go above and beyond the formal leadership, many formal leadership roles that she has played here. And I am deeply appreciative for her thoughtful, collaborative, and compassionate approach to service and leadership that she consistently provides with integrity and with the, the impact of positive benefit for others. She is a glowing exemplar of distinguished service. So we are fortunate to be able to hear from her today through her lecture, to serve or not to serve. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to our three very distinguished honorees. We'll go in the order of um, Professor Warren, Professor Wainwright, Professor Prasad, and they'll just um, proceed in that order. And then you'll hear from me again at the end of their presentations. So without further ado, Mark, I'll turn it over to you. <clears throat> okay. Well, thank you so much, um, <clears throat> Joe, and uh, thank, I want to thank Marcelo and the committee that uh, nominated me for the award uh, today. As uh, Marcelo and both Joe said, I am a, I'm a sociologist, but I'm a community-engaged scholar, and I think to my knowledge, I am the first uh, self-identified community-engaged scholar to actually win the Distinguished Scholarship Award here at UMass. Uh, <laughs> uh, folks who did the, we have a lot of faculty here who do this work. Uh, people have won other awards, uh, which are also highly distinguished and very important, but I think it's uh, also an opportunity to highlight that the kind of scholarship that we do, which is you know, conducted in really in deep partnerships with communities uh, who are marginalized in this country and struggling for social justice and racial equity, be recognized as a really important uh, form of scholarship. And I actually believe that the kind of work that we do is, if not as rigorous, more rigorous than other kinds of scholarship, because we are accountable not just to a scholarly community, but to also to folks who are, who are experiencing the world and are organizing on the ground. And particularly for myself, as a white male scholar, uh, I spent a lot of my time building relationships uh, with people over many years on the ground so that I hold myself accountable to the scholarly community and my work is published in, in academic venues, but I also work very hard to hold myself accountable to people who are uh, uh, mostly uh, low-income communities of color, parents and young people who are struggling for racial equity and educational justice. So I want to talk um, a little bit about community-engaged scholarship and a little bit about my most recent project, the Willful Defiance book here, uh, just to give you uh, a sense and to lift up a few points about uh, this important work. Um, <clears throat> I do this work because I, I hold a very strong core belief that community organizing and social movements with people who are most impacted by uh, injustice in our country at the center of them, that those movements are really fundamentally necessary to transform our institutions like public education towards racial equity and social justice. And so the, if you really believe that, as I do, then I see my role as a scholar to be conducting research in partnership with those communities and producing knowledge and theory and practical strategies that can help strengthen those movements and have a direct impact on our public educational system, moving it towards justice. I believe that the model where researchers operating uh, separately uh, from communities who then do research that is disconnected and then advise other uh, policymakers 
and, uh, and public officials who then develop reform strategies and pose them down on communities. I believe that's a fundamentally broken system and has been operated to perpetuate racial and class and other forms of injustice in our educational system and therefore we need a new model for how are we going to create uh, real systemic change in our public education system. And my own research and the research of many others has demonstrated that people who are most impacted have a fundamental role to play in challenging those systems of injustice, like the school to prison pipeline, which is a focus of more recently of my own work, and really developing collaborative solutions, community-based solutions to move our education system forward. My work is, I think, a little different than some other um, people who do community aid scholarship. I focus uh, my research more on documenting and analyzing and lifting up organizing processes and movement building strategies, not so much studying the problems or the issues that people are working on, although it's very important. My work's a little different because I, I really document and study movement building and organizing in partnership with people who are doing it. And secondly, my work is a little distinctive and sometimes different because I work nationally with organizing groups and movements. And so the work that I did with um, Willful Defiance, I developed in partnership with local organizing groups in places like Chicago. Um, in fact, I guess I probably, I'm not sure if this is working. Um, well, I'll come back to that. These various partners that I had that were all over the country, as well as the national alliances like the Dignity in Schools Campaign and the Alliance for Educational Justice, uh, who are struggling for change at a national level. And so with this kind of project, um, it's very important, uh, as I think people do this work knows, to build really strong, uh, grounded relationships with people. So this is actually, this book is actually the result of a 10-year uh, process of building relationships that I started literally 10 years ago with these organizing groups, which in fact was built on work that I'd already been doing for uh, starting probably 20 years before that. So it's really a story of relationships, of trust, of people challenging me uh, and also finding common ground and eventually finding shared values, uh, working together. Uh, we co-designed the research for this project. It did involve rigorous qualitative research, multiple case studies, interviews with and focus groups with almost 200 participants, participant observation and documents. But we also produ we produced a book, we actually produced another book called Lift Us Up, Don't Push Us Out. So two books came out of this, but we also produced a, a toolkit and other kinds of resources for movement building. And so the whole idea of this is that we're doing a, a collaborative research project that has multiple outputs, uh, contributes to academic scholarship, but also contributes in practical ways to communities who are struggling for change. Um, <clears throat> let me just say that the title, Willful Defiance, uh, you may know uh, or not know that every year hundreds of thousands of students, mainly black and brown students, indigenous students, and students with disabilities get suspended from school for something called willful defiance, which could be as simple as you know, refusing to take your hat off when asked to by a teacher or questioning a teacher as to why your history textbook has been published in, in Texas and is this really the history that you should be learning. These all can count as willful defiance. Uh, it's uh, not just uh, <clears throat> grounds for suspension, but in many states, it's uh, actually a criminal act. And so we see here the picture of uh, Naya Kenny, who filmed uh, her co-student, another black girl, Shakar, who was, uh, had be, uh, well, she was asked to turn in her cell phone. She said she didn't have one on it. A uh, school police officer was called in and she declined to turn her phone over to him because she said she didn't have it on her. He, grabbed her, slew, threw her to the floor, and dragged her across the floor. Naya Kenny, the girl that's shown here, took a video of it, which went viral. This is in Spring Valley, North, uh, South Carolina. Some people might remember this. They were both arrested and charged with criminal disrupting school. Um, and it started a national campaign to get those charges dropped, and it was one of the turning points in the police free schools movement. So when we talk about the school to prison pipeline, we're talking about racially discriminatory systems of exclusionary discipline, suspensions and expulsions for things like willful defiance and the presence of and policing activities in our schools that uh, arrest uh, over 60,000 students every year, again, mostly black and brown students or refer them to law enforcement. So uh, we tried to flip the script with the title of willful defiance. 
because we said, well, if a system is really designed to punish and control and criminalize young children of color, that it is actually right and necessary for people to willfully defy that system. And it's not about standing up individually to do that, where you can be arrested and punished, but how do people come together, students, young people, parents, and community members to collectively challenge that system. And I actually, um, <clears throat> There's key themes that come about it, and I just want to mention this issue of the vital importance of people most impacted. So if I had gave this talk 10 or 15 years ago, I would imagine that very few people in this room might even know what the term school to prison pipeline was. Uh, now it's in more popular discourse. It turns out that the first people to name and challenge the school to prison pipeline were not academics like myself. They were not educators. They were not policymakers. They were not the traditional civil rights community in Washington. It was a group of black uh, parents and organizers in Holmes County, Mississippi in 1996 who named the schoolhouse the jailhouse track, even at the very moment that the whole system was being implemented and led one of the first campaigns to challenge it when uh, a group of black boys were on a bus throwing popcorn, or black children throwing popcorn at each other. The popcorn hit the back of the white school bus driver and she drove the bus straight to the police station and seven African-American boys were arrested and charged with criminal assault for hitting the white driver with a uh, piece of popcorn. And that is the origins. And it's important because it gets back to this question of how are we really going to address the systemic racism that we have in our public education system? Who are the people who are gonna play an important role, a critical role in challenging that? There's other things here. There was a lot of analysis and theory about building national movements that are locally rooted. I can happy to come back to that. Um, <clears throat> But I will say, I want to also say a little bit about, uh, you know, what does it mean to write a, an academic book that's also a resource for movement building? And I think that's an interesting question. It was an experiment. It was a challenge for us. Uh, we we not, did not partner just to produce the book and that toolkit. We then started partnering with a broad array of, of efforts to use the book and the research that's highlighted in the book to engage multiple stakeholders. We had a, a big uh, movement uh, launch and celebration, some of these people giving you a sense of the various people who were connected to this with hundreds of participants. We held uh, book events and community university settings with educators, with advocacy groups. We had over 35 of these. This is actually one of the very rare occur occurrences where I'm speaking about this book on my own. In principle, I will speak with a community partner, a parent or a young person who's actually, so that people have a chance to speak for themselves. But in any case, uh, we did, we, so we engaged in the, the academic world and the policy making world, but we also did um, read alouds. Oops, let me come back to that one. Some of these are out of order here. But we, anyway, we did some read alouds with parents and organizing groups who may not be used to reading a book. So we went into communities and we read sections of the book aloud and people talked about the history of the movement and their current work. We wrote uh, a half, uh, six or seven blogs. We built a website with resources that uh, over 7,000 people have visited. We had the social media campaign. We produced all these resources. So I just wanna give people just a little sketch of what it, what, what it might mean to do uh, a project over this kind of range that produces scholarship but also tries to work with people on the ground to influence their local, their local and national policymakers. We were particularly active in the police free schools movement. Uh, that kind of broke on the scene in 2020 through the mass protests against police racism. People may not know that or, uh, parents and young people and organizing groups around the country have been calling for the removal of police from schools for 10 years before that. Uh, in 2000, they were told they were crazy, that will never happen. 2012, the Black Organizing Project in Oakland declared that their goal was to remove police entirely from Oakland schools within 10 years. And on the backs of that mass protest, they actually succeeded in doing that. So I think it's an important story about not just a demand for change, but what it takes to really organize, build relationships, do political education, develop policy proposals, work with uh, local public officials to really create not just a protest movement, but a movement that can change policy and practice in our schools. So um, I know I don't have too much time, so I want to end uh, with just a couple of reflections. Um, <clears throat> just like I don't like to talk alone about this book, I also feel like there's a little bit of a contradiction in being a community engaged scholar that wins an individual award for scholarship. 
Uh, I do play an important role, and I'm, I'm proud of that. But uh, I, I would, and I, I would like to thank uh, the university for making, offering me this award. And I would also like to thank the McCormick Graduate School and my own Department of Public Policy and Public Affairs, because these these are institutions that really care about doing research that has an impact in the world, particularly around questions of systemic injustice. So this has been a great home for me to do this work. But I would also like to accept the award on behalf of my partners who aren't here, because I really do believe it's the co-production of knowledge. I really do believe that a lot of what I am able to discern and analyze and offer in some of my own writing is really knowledge and analysis that we have produced together, um, and not as an individual. And I'd also like to say that uh, it's, it's nice, it's wonderful to win an individual award, and Joe has been very kind to mention some others I've won, but I, I hope that what it can do is inspire uh, other scholars, maybe younger scholars. There are just so many scholars of color, so many women scholars, uh, queer and trans scholars who want to do this kind of work, and they want to make a career in the academy. So I hope that by winning these kinds of awards, I am a white man, but uh, I think many people are making a career of this, and I think it's, we need a movement within the academy as well. Uh, and I hope that winning this award is a, also a contribution to that movement. So I just want to end by saying that, uh, you know, I do really firmly believe that it's going to take a combined e effort of people on the ground, parents and young people, with organizers, with scholars, with educators and policymakers, to really transform our educational system towards racial equity, educational justice, and actually liberation for our young people. And uh, I am honored to play, you know, my part in building that movement. And that is really, you know, how I think about the work that I do. The work I do in scholarship, but also the work I do in teaching, and the work I do in service in an integrated way. So thank you very much. I want to first say what an extreme honor it was to be given this award. When the chancellor called me, I was literally speechless. Uh, teaching has been the absolute best part of my work at UMass Boston, and this award means the world to me. Thanks to the selection committee and to my colleagues in the psych department uh, who put forward the nomination for me. But most of all, thanks goes to my students over the years. I've taught many different courses while at UMass, and I've taught many of those courses several times over. And never once has it felt like the same old thing. Each semester, my students bring something new to my experience of sharing information with them. While I have explained the meaning of statistical significance literally thousands of times, uh, uh, I'm struck by the fact that even now in answering a question or giving an example, I can catch something new in what it means to convey a concept to another person. When I step into the classroom, I learn so much. My continued enthusiasm comes from at least two places. One is, of course, the amazing diversity that exists in our classrooms and the interactions with students. Both our undergraduate and graduate students bring such a wide range of experiences and challenges to our classroom. Everyone in this room has stories of students overcoming incredible barriers, first to be at UMass, and then to stay and complete their degrees. For the last decade or so, I have also had the wonderful opportunity to teach a seminar for our graduate students who are teaching as instructors of record for the first time. It is an amazing circumstance to be able to spend the fall semester each year thinking with those graduate instructors about what happens over the course of a semester and how to provide the most accessible and successful course material. To brainstorm about best practices enriches my own teaching each year, especially as the grad students introduce strategies into their teaching that connect me to the most current ways of sharing information. It is my grad students 
who I look to for an explanation about why my undergraduate students might take a picture on their phone of my PowerPoint slide that's on Blackboard. <laughs> when I started teaching here over 35 years ago, we all wrote information on chalkboards. I walked around with chalk in my pockets in case the room that I taught in didn't have any chalk. Using a chalkboard was valuable because it could help to control the pace of my lectures. But it also had moments of being quite revealing to, for me. I am not a proficient speller, and spelling at a chalkboard <laughs> seems to be substantially harder. I learned early on that being authoritative about my expectations with my students didn't have to be tied to always being right. Humility went a long way in developing learning relationships. The next advancement in the presentation of teaching was the use of an overhead projector. <laughs> uh, these required you to have transparencies of lecture material and equipment that you collected before each class at the AV office. Between classes, one could see many faculty pushing carts in the halls, ferrying the projectors to and from their classrooms. Every once in a while, you would see someone pushing an overhead cart with one hand and pulling a huge cart with a very large TV and a VCR with the other. Uh, we didn't just show a short video clip. <laughs> but with the shift from a chalkboard to an overhead, I learned about the value of consistency of what was on the transparencies. And I was able to share diagrams and graphs so that I could point to specific important aspects of published materials. This changed the way I taught and helped me to think about the way that images could increase understanding and accessibility of information. Imagine how much further I moved when PowerPoint was introduced that allowed me to create slides that could be used during class, but also distributed to students for their own use. Again, I found that while creating a lecture took more time at first, I had a product that was more reliable in terms of what I showed to my students. I could quickly update it, and I could return to it whenever a student had questions. I had classrooms that had projectors built right in, and it was easy to link external mediums like video clips. What an expansion of tools to create illustration and context. So at each moment, as the means of presenting material changed, I found that I incrementally learned more about what it means to provide multiple points of access to material, as well as ways to return to material again when necessary. Each of these moments has absolutely enhanced my teaching, not because I was looking for a specific new development, but because new ways to present were made available, and in stepping slowly into the waters of improved technology, I found better ways to present the same old thing so that a wider range of learners gained access. It's not lost on anybody here that the driver of this story is IT. And never was there a moment in our teaching history when we had to change our methods and rely on IT more than in March of 2022. If there was ever a moment when we pivoted, it was that one week in March when over spring break, we all learned what Zoom was. Over the remaining weeks of the semester, we all struggled with how to mute and unmute ourselves, how to share our screens, and how to teach to a large number of little teeny boxes, most of which were either black or had high quality uh, screenshots that didn't really look like the student who turned on their camera. <laughs> we made this pivot not because we thought it was good pedagogy, but because we were left with nothing else. And the absolute heroes of that moment were our small but intrepid IT department. We all owe a tremendous shout out to them. But despite the fact that I did not 
like teaching on Zoom and felt that students did not learn as well. I also learned a lot about teaching during that time, just like in other moments of my career. My teaching changed and enlarged because of having to think about how information could be convey conveyed on Zoom to our students who are now struggling in more ways than ever. But I know we didn't really like teaching that way, and most of us feel like being in the classroom has substantial benefits over being apart. So in the fall of 2021, I, like most of my colleagues, was thrilled to be back in the classroom. I think that most of us believed that we would slide back into teaching in the old familiar way that we were all used to. And we all know by now that we didn't really did do that, did we? Almost everyone I spoke with throughout fall 2021 and spring 2022 struggled with attendance in a way that was far beyond anything we have ever struggled with before. Students continued to struggle with illness and emotional stability, work schedules and family responsibilities, and we as instructors were left trying to sort out how much time away was too much time away. Could someone really miss many weeks and make it all up in a few days? Could we really keep from being offended by being asked to respond to that question? How could a student be okay in our class when they had missed the four weeks of work we had just done? By the end of the spring semester last year, and over the summer, I found myself thinking a lot about what to do about teaching difficulties that we now faced. It isn't business as usual, that's for sure. Had we let a genie out of a bottle in terms of whether students needed to be present and active learners, only to find that we couldn't recapture it? I returned to campus this fall not expecting to be back, that doesn't seem to exist anymore. But I continued to wonder about our new, what our new normal meant for my teaching. And then, again, the IT superheroes poked at me. I went to a webinar this fall about BeaconFlex. I thought I should know more about it because I knew, uh, it, w I, I knew it suggested that it might work. And it, was, it would be difficult, and it was only really for a few spaces on campus, right? Uh, but I learned from the IT staff and from the faculty who had, um, who had been willing to work with BeaconFlex that it was actually not that different from all the previous technology innovations that have come about during my teaching career. Faculty identified that their first few semesters were growth semesters in getting used to having students face-to-face -face and online at the same time, but they also identified the same thing I already knew from my years of teaching, that when we ask ourselves to teach in some new way, our teaching expands and we see brand new ways to share information. And that those new ways are very likely touching students who might not have been adequately touched when we stuck to our old strategies. Because I came to the webinar disgruntled about attendance, it really stood out to me when someone asked if Beacon Flex classes turned into really two classes, one who came face to face and the other who was remote. And the faculty reported that was not really what happened. That all students came to the classroom when they could. That it was also what they wanted, by and large. But that many students used the remote option when things became overwhelming. It gave them the option to continue to get course content, even when their li life created a barrier. And I realized in that moment that again, it was all about providing our diverse students with the greatest amount of access to seek higher education, sometimes against all odds. So now I feel obliged 
to think before I make a decision about my teaching, how far can I pivot and for what and whose benefit? Here's a funny joke when O'Day called me and said that I, uh, I needed to make time in my schedule uh, for a phone call with the <laughs> chancellor. I thought I was being called to be slapped on the wrist for something that I had done bad. So, <laughs> so I thank the provost and the ch uh, chancellor very much for this uh, honor and because of my, because this is about service, uh, it's really important for me to uh, thank the faculty members in my department uh, who, who put my nomination packet together, as well as the faculty members who served on the committee. Okay, so here goes. To serve or not to serve. One Monday morning this fall, September 5th to be precise, an email popped up in my inbox. Its subject, just say no. <laughs> A week later, September 12th, another email, the art of saying no. <laughs> and then again the following Monday, <clears throat> September 19th, saying no at mid-career, <laughs> three weeks in a row. What was I being counseled to say no to? You guessed it, service. All three of these missives came from the National Center for Faculty Development and Diversity, a national organization focused on professional development of faculty. In essence, an organization that I respect very much and whose programs I have availed of myself was deploying the same tagline as one that was used by the US government's war on drugs in the late 20th century. This felt just a little dissonant to me because just a few months prior, I had been honored and feted by my university with the Chancellor's Distinguished Service Award. Service, alongside scholarship and teaching, had shaped and enriched my professional path. It had helped me build community and connections. Service had opened up avenues for leadership. Still, I was not naive. I understood and appreciated that these strategically timed messages at the start of the semester were for my benefit meant to empower me and give me permission to opt out of service. Because, let's be frank, in the triad that constitutes a faculty member's professional activity, research, teaching, and service, service is the thing that drags us down. In the lexical field of academic discourse, terms used to describe service often have negative connotations. The word service is frequently followed up with the word burden, service burden. We speak of being overextended by service. We insist that junior faculty must be protected or shielded from service. New prospects in research and teaching generate excitement, but when faced with a service request, we ask ourselves the very existential question of whether to do it at all, to serve or not to serve. Is it because faculty are a disengaged bunch, divorced from the collectivity of university life, concerned with our own personal advancement and research agendas? No, of course not, and that was a rhetorical question. <laughs> the reasons are structural, systemic, and emblematic of the increasingly competitive pressures of life in higher education. In the same decades that I have come of age as an academic, navigating my own idiosyncratic but fulfilling work life of service, teaching, and research, there have been some significant shifts in the academic workplace. An, Im an important one is the gradual casualization of academic labor, brought about by privatization of higher education and cutbacks in state funding to public universities. According to the 2021 annual report on the economic, sta of the economic status of the profession by the AAUP, the American Association of University Professors, tenure stream faculty now make up 37% of the American professoriate. This is down from 78% in 1969. In other words, the vast majority are contingent faculty. AAUP reports that two thirds of the contingent faculty are part-time. The changing and casualized nature of, academic, of the academic workforce means that while there is a good bit of service work to go around, there are fewer full-time and tenure stream faculty a bit, uh, uh, able to commit the time and energy for it, right? As for contingent faculty, they represent academia's version of the gig economy, 
who cannot be expected to invest their time in serving institutions whose compact with them is defined by transience and precarity. As I come of age as an academic, universities have also begun to do the important work of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And these very DEI initiatives, paradoxically, have led to an inequitable distribution of service. The participation of faculty of color is called upon in two ways to either represent diversity in standing committees, and in addition, to engage in new initiatives that promote DEI. This is a double-edged sword for faculty of color, who are very much invested in the fruits and promise of DEI labor, but who end up being stretched thin. There are many names that scholars have given for this, cultural taxation, problematic popularity, etc. And then there's the question of gender inequity in service, about which there is now an ever-growing literature in every discipline from STEM to the humanities and across every type of higher education, higher ed educational institution. Women spend more hours per week on service than men. They do more unrecognized, relationally oriented, and invisible forms of service like mentoring. They perform internal service more frequently than more visible forms of external service. They have been shown to take longer on average than men to advance from associate to full professor. The Modern Language Association's last report on, uh, on the status of women in the profession report, referred to this poignantly as standing still. Another scholar calls it the ivory ceiling of service. At this point, there may be some of you in the audience who may be thinking that you came here to listen to an inspiring talk about service activities of an awardee, and instead you're getting something in between a laundry list of issues in higher education and a feminist manifesto. Um, to be clear, my intention is not to address or solve the complex web of issues in academia. But as someone who is deeply grateful for having been recognized for my service, I think it is my ethical responsibility to acknowledge the broader and often imperfect context in which service is performed and think creatively about other capacious ways in which service of other faculty members may be appreciated and recognized, which is the actual elephant in the room about service in academia, that it is poorly conceptualized, undervalued, and less likely to lead to career advancement. But before I go on to another problem, <laughs> let, me say, let me say a few things about myself and my own service journey. Um, I'd like to highlight a few aspects of my service record that are the closest to my heart. The first began when I first got here in the early 2000s as an assistant professor of French after teaching in a private liberal arts college in the Midwest. Although I knew very well not to expect a traditional student body that I had been used to, there were still many things that surprised me about the students here. Compared to those uniquely American distractions like pep rallies and football games and fraternity parties in which I had been schooled by my previous students, I was struck by the fact that my students here had absolutely no time for leisure. My students worked a lot, they worked in the evenings, they worked on weekends. Yet, the French curriculum and course sequencing was so rigid in the way that it was structured that it gave students with strict, strict work and, and family commitments very little room to maneuver in terms of their path through the curriculum. My students were also very diverse. As an ex example, here's a quick and dirty overview of the demographics of the 14-person class that I am teaching this semester, and it mirrors what I've had through the, through the years that I've taught here. Two students are of French-speaking West African origin, two are North African in heritage, three of them are from the French-speaking Caribbean, four are Latinx, and the rest are white. Three of the 14 are parents, mothers of young children, and not one of them could be here this afternoon because of their commitments. The French curriculum back in the 2000s was almost entirely centered on France. You know that little country up in Europe? <laughs> Nothing against France. They are my World Cup team. Go Mbappe. Um, but in other words, it soon became clear to me that this inflexible French curriculum, grounded purely in European and Western epistemological tradition, had to be transformed to make it more flexible and accessible to my students, more culturally responsible, res responsive, so that they remain engaged and persisted. 
I played with diagrams and flowcharts to make course sequencing more accommodating to the students. I culled relevant courses from other departments into the French major so as to expand the scheduling um, options for them. I remember going over and talking to colleagues in another department um, uh, to include a unit on the Haitian Revolution because it was you know, as important as the French Revolution. And then, of course, I passed all of that through governance. So I'm, you know, that's one example of the service I've done. The second service activity that I'd like to spotlight is the outreach, mentoring, and organizing that I do for the undergraduate research portfolio that I, in C uh, that I direct in CLA, which was first formulated by a group of faculty in the college who had similar goals for CLA students as I did for those in my department. And that was to give students the opportunity to develop a series of research experiences that could be incorporated into and alongside the coursework that they are already doing rather than adding an additional unwieldy requirement on their plate. It attracts student various, uh, students from various disciplines in CLA and gives them the independence to pursue the portfolio at their own pace. And the third type of service work that I'd like to share with you, which is qualitatively different from the first that I mentioned, is the work I do off campus in my profession with emerging scholars in my discipline. I mentor a cohort of junior scholars and graduate students in my field on their research. I comment on their dissertations and monographs. I work with them to polish their articles as they send them up for prizes or journal submissions. I set up conference panels with them. I support the work of these emerging practitioners because I want to play a small part in shaping the direction of my field. Now, I've been somewhat strategic in spotlighting these service contributions that I've just detailed. If you notice, I did not use the word committee, task force, working group, advisory board, executive committee, president, chairperson, although if you look through my CV, you will probably see those keywords appear a few times. That's because I want to throw into sharper relief the unsung and less illustrious forms of service that faculty engage in that fly under the radar, but that give us purpose and that have an impact on the constituencies that we serve. Students, colleagues, the community, the broader pub public, the dis our disciplines. You may also notice that in talking about my service, I've done an awful lot of mentioning of my teaching and my research. The distinctions between them for me are porous, uh, service, teaching, and research are mutually informing and organically related. So after that little peek into my own experience with service, how do we reframe, reimagine, and rehabilitate service? Here are some ideas, nothing super profound, but just some things that have been batting around in my head and combined with some readings that I've done. We may start by making some changes to our language when we talk about service. As the 2022 Nobel laureate and French novelist Annie Ernaux says, language is never neutral. That was my blatant attempt at being very topical. <laughs> uh, for instance, I've heard terms like institutional housekeeping uh, being used to refer to university service, even by those who want to underscore the importance of service. This is a very loaded term as it conjures up the humdrum of domestic chores, while the real and more essential labor is happening elsewhere. How about institution building instead? Is that not ma what many of us faculty did when we participated in the strategic planning process? Um, we can also conceptualize service as an activity that is balanced with research and teaching rather than subservient to research and teaching. Um, and as I was poking around on the internet, I saw that the University of Texas, for instance, had recently piloted something called the Distinguished Service Academy, which is made up of a group of faculty uh, of distinguished tenured and senior non-tenure track faculty members with extraordinary achievements in service who provide leadership and mentoring. And this includes, for instance, workshops for junior faculty that, that help them create career goals and, and a career narrative that includes personally and institutionally meaningful service. But the most important and most difficult is a serious reconsideration of how service is evaluated in personnel and promotional decisions. And because I cannot be very articulate about this, I'm just going to quote one um, author that I read as I was preparing for this talk, uh, Bruce McFarland uh, in The Academic Citizen. He writes, the academy tends to reward individual performance um, in research and teaching, but few have addressed the more complex question of evaluating contributions for the collective good via academic citizenship. 
If universities fail to take up this challenge, it will make it harder to maintain public support and understanding for the role of higher education in society." End quote. Now coming back to myself in particular, it would be disingenuous for me to claim that I personally have been undervalued because my service has led me to positions of greater administrative responsibility, which carry with them some prestige. Lots of headaches also, but some <laughs> prestige. And in that, I am a particular kind of faculty human. Just like it takes all kinds to make up this world, um, not all professors are cut from the same cloth, nor should they be. A faculty member's own call to service and contribution to the world may be about making the next big scientific discovery to be published in Nature and Science or writing a paradigm shifting book. Not everybody is cut out to serve on committees or to be chair of a department. In fact, we don't want those absent-minded professors in, on, on committees, right? <laughs> um, we need to recognize, however, in, that in order for that book or for that first authored peer-reviewed article to exist, there is an entire infrastructure of service that buttresses it. Conference organizing, editing of journals, and most importantly, that thankless and anonymous job of peer reviewing. So to return to what I started off with, just say no. Just say no can seem very energizing at first, but it can only go so far because it is an individual response to what requires broader structural solutions. We must all work together so that service is not always someone else's work. Thank you. Pratima, Laurel, Mark, thank you very much. You know, this has been an, not only an opportunity to honor and recognize your significant contributions, but to have a moment to pause and reflect and learn from you. You know, I was thinking about what are some of the adjectives, right, that describe what we heard here this afternoon. You know, enlightening, inspiring, um, equitable, just, values and mission driven, uh, collaborative, uh, compassionate. Um, but in thinking about, you know, and, and, and I think that Fatima, the way that you finished, right, to talk about what's the relationship between teaching and scholarship and service. You know, we treat these as these three parallel things and actually they are interwoven, right, in the fabric of who we are and what we do. And this is the very best of who we are as faculty, as academics, as members of the UMass Boston community. And so whether it's engaging in scholarship where we're truly being responsive to and in collaborative with um, not just other academics, but experts who are experts in a wide range of fields, perspectives, positions, whether no matter what the technological shifts that we encounter, that pedagogy is about being responsive to and in relationship with our students, our learners, our colleagues, and that our service is not just about what we do individually, but what is the collective impact that we can make together to elevate others. And so as we leave here, you know, I'm inspired by those messages and the fact that not only that the three of you have done such great work, but that these are the values and the activities and the impacts that we as an academic community are elevating and that your work contributes to and that we have so many other colleagues who also engage in this kind of work, but do so not in isolation, but with a broad range of diverse communities. So thank you for providing leadership, right? Service is leadership, teaching is leadership, scholarship is leadership. And thank you all for being here. And now I invite everybody to join with our honorees in a reception right next door here and have a wonderful rest of the afternoon and evening. Thank you so much. Thank you.